Yeah, my, my title uh, or, or my presentation today is um, about the simulation of granular material. So I will um, touch a little bit on set valued analysis. I will not talk about plasticity. Um, I'm afraid I have to talk about friction, but I will mostly brush it under the rug. And I'm a little bit nervous about that point because I know there's some um, experts on friction here in the, in the audience. So we'll see how that, how that plays out. Okay, so um, yeah, well, like you were confused a little bit about um, my work. So basically uh, what I'm presenting here is, is um, the work that I conducted as part of my PhD thesis, which I wrote from 2012 to um, 2015. And I uh, wrote it at the Fraunhofer Institute for Industrial Mathematics in Kaiserslautern. Um, my supervisor was Ben Simeon from the Technical University of Kaiserslautern, and my second grader was Alessandro Tassora from the University of Parma. And um, actually, I don't I don't work on this topic anymore. So I, you know, I spend a lot of time working on it, and um, I'm still very interested in it. But um, maybe take this as a disclaimer. So I'm showing you old results here from a field that I'm still very interested in. Um, so now I've, I've uh, worked at different places. Currently, I'm working at the DLR. And uh, Oleg, just because um, you asked, this is uh, the, the German Aerospace Center. So it's, it's kind of like, yeah. So, so I, I write software for um, yeah, aer aerospace applications now. And um, right I'll, before I start my talk, I'll, I just want to take the um, opportunity to also thank you very much, Oleg, for um, organizing this workshop and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk here. Okay, so um, let's begin by a motivation. So why um, is it that, that uh, we were interested in simulating granular material and why is it that we were interested in um, going for a non-smooth method? So the department where I wrote my PhD thesis um, is very much interested in the fatigue assessment. And we were working on a project where um, we were working on the fatigue assessment of earth moving equipment. So if you look at this um, far left picture here, you see um, an excavator that is digging in soil and is being operated by a driver. And if you compare this to the middle animation um, where you see like a typical multi-body simulation, you see that two main uh, sources of the loads are missing. So the, the mechanical loads on the machine depend on the machine itself, but also on the driver and on the soil tool interaction. And my department was interested in um, modeling all three, and uh, my work concentrated on the soil tool interaction here. And um, so very early in the beginning of our project, it was clear that we want to model um, the soil using um, a large number of rigid bodies subject to unilateral contact and friction. Now, this is not the only choice for a for soil model, obviously. We could have uh, gone for a PDE or, or something different. I don't want to go into the details, but we, we decided um, to, to use this. And um, if you do that, you have kind of two paradigms that you can go for. You can, you can use classical discrete element methods using uh, penalty terms, or you can use a non-smooth contact dynamics uh, approach using hard constraints. So let me just very quickly um, touch on the discrete element method. So um, the idea is very simple. Every particle is allowed to move freely uh, according to Newton's second law of motion. And um, particles are allowed to overlap. And whenever they do, so whenever two particles touch, um, we calculate a normal contact force Fn, which is proportional to the overlap delta. And uh, the proportionality constant is this uh, normal stiffness k. And um, if you like, you can have um, also like a, a damping term here. So um, my internal supervisor at, at the Fraunhofer was um, Martin Obermeier, and he wrote his PhD thesis on the discrete element method and uh, the assessment of, of uh, draft forces. So I'm, I'm showing a short result from him, which I think is very impressive. So it's just um, the, the experiment compared to the simulation and uh, it looks super realistic. And um, it's not just that, uh, it's also that the draft forces, so the forces acting on the bucket are also very realistic. So he spent uh, much time in calibrating the model and uh, he, he got some very impressive results. Now there's a big caveat with the, with the discrete element method though. So um, 
these differences are typically very, very large. So uh, the method is only stable for very small time steps. I'm talking about, I don't know, like 10 to the minus five seconds or 10 to the minus seven seconds. And this is um, kind of what, what got us interested in the non-smooth methods. Because if you, if you think about it a little bit, um, in reality, two, two pieces of, of um, granular matter don't overlap. Right? There's a small compression phase and a decompression phase. And uh, one way to look at the discrete element method is that the um, small penetrations are an emulation of the compression and decompression phase. So in, in the DEM, we have to resolve the problem at time scales that are absolutely of no interest to us um, from the application po point of view. Right? So um, from a larger time scale perspective, all collisions seem to be resolved instantaneously. And the idea is if you use a non-smooth method, can we um, use larger time steps? And um, well, it turns out, yes. So in non-smooth methods, um, the, the limit on the time step size is not stability, but only the accuracy. So um, I'll, I'll uh, use this slide to, to kind of ease into the theory part of, of my talk now. All right, so let's let's take a closer look at the bouncing ball, just to look at um, uh, what what kind of function spaces we are working with. So here you see uh, the bouncing ball, and I um, demand at every point in time that the distance between the ground and the ball shall always be greater or equal to zero. And as a consequence. Um, the velocity must have discontinuities, right? So, so just right immediately before the impact with the ground, the velocity must jump from a negative value to at least a non-negative value. So we have to live with discontinuous velocities. Um, but the, the number of discontinuity points must be um, countable and uh, yeah, the, in general, the functions are of bounded variation. But the positions, so the antiderivative of the of the velocities, um, are obviously continuous. So, so our ball cannot disappear and reappear else, elsewhere. Um, more precisely, they are absolutely continuous functions. Now, the difficulty comes when uh, we want to calculate the derivative of the velocities, because obviously um, the derivative of the der velocities uh, exists almost everywhere, except at those points which are really interesting. Yeah, so. Um, uh, every time we have an impact, the acceleration is really a Dirac delta measure here. So we, we have to say that the velocity in general is only differentiable in a weak sense. So um, accelerations and forces are not classical functions anymore, but um, they only exist in a weak sense. And we can identify these weak derivatives with um, the signed radon measures. So um, the signed radon measures uh, can be identified with or other words, let me put it this way. The, the dual space of absolutely continuous functions can be um, identified with the signed to measures in the sense that we can write uh, a dual pairing as an integral over this measure. So um, yeah, so we don't have any accelerations and functions as classical, uh, accelerations and, and, and forces as classical functions anymore. Okay, so let's, let's keep this in mind. Now I'm going to, um, uh, try to formulate my, my granular model as uh, a constrained dynamical system. And um, I will start with inequality constraints. So I, have, I have lots of um, spheres, which, which, uh, consists, con uh, which make up my granular material. And for each um, pair of spheres, I demand that um, the distance shall always be greater or equal to zero. So I have lots of inequality constraints. And um, a slightly more complicated way of uh, writing this is as uh, stating that instead of, instead of stating that G must be greater or equal to zero, I can say that G must be in some set. Yeah, and this set is just the set of positive reads because uh, yeah, we are uh, talking about set valued analysis here. So why not? Now suppose I want to um, have equality constraints as well. So maybe I want to um, glue two particles together or I want to add um, a multi-body model of my excavator monolithically in, in my calculations where I want to have idealized constraints. So let's just say I want um, equality constraints then I can reformulate these also as inclusion in some set. So this would be the set that contains only the zero. Um, 
right? At this point, I can give you a definition, but I think everybody is comfortable with that. So um, any subset of a vector space that is uh, closed with respect to positive linear combinations is called a convex cone. And you will notice that both the sets that I introduced here are convex cones. So um, here's an idea. Why, why don't you just formulate all constraints on the system as conical inclusions? Well, um, why would we do that? Well, firstly, um, we can use some results from continuous optimizations, uh, which, which uh, are really helpful both in a function space setting also, and also for the discretized equations in the end for the numerical method. And secondly, um, I can apply my, my dirty little friction trick that um, I'm going to talk about on the next slide. So um, my model includes Coulomb friction and um, this is just, uh, yeah, so this is a textbook example we've seen before um, of just a, a brick on an inclined slope. And um, we have a tangential contact velocity, which is the frictional force that uh, maximizes the energy dissipation in this contact, subject to the constraint that it is restricted in magnitude by this value. So uh, something proportional to the normal contact force and the um, proportionality constant here is called the frictional coefficient. And again, I can, I can reformulate this as an inclusion into a convex cone. And uh, this is just, I'm, I'm going to say that the total contact force uh, lambda uh, must be included in the Coulomb friction cone, which is just a set of three-dimensional vectors that satisfy this inequality. Um, now in, in their famous paper uh, of de Sachse and Feng from uh, I think the end of the 90s, they show that um, Coulomb friction is um, together with unilateral contact is, pro is, is um, equivalent to this cone complementarity problem. So here on the right hand side, we have the same inclusion as in, this, in the standard way of writing things. Then you introduce a new vector nu, which can be calculated from the um, normal contact displacement velocity and the tangential contact displacement velocity. And this must be contained in the dual cone of the friction cone. Right. Um, and then both vectors must be orthogonal. So um, in all generality, the dual cone um, for a cone K is just the subset of the dual space consisting of all functionals that are positive. And in finite dimensions, as you can see here in this picture, it's just the set of all vectors that form an acute angle to all vectors in K. Okay, so you have um, your one vector, which is in the dual cone, another vector, which is in the cone, and they have to be orthogonal to each other. And um, to me, this, this looks a lot like the complementarity problems that you typically, typically get from um, constraint optimization. So if you have an optimization problem with inequality constraints or conical constraints, uh, you end up with a complementarity problem that looks like this. So um, the idea is, can we, in a sense, mimic Coulomb friction as a real enormous conical constraint? So this, this is what I mean by, by dirty tricks. So this is obviously cheating, right? So um, I know I can only do this with uh, approximations, but uh, in the end, uh, in the numerics, it works out and that's, that's enough for me. So um, can we directly use the conical inclusion from the de Sachse and Feng paper? Well, no because um, if you write out what the, what the dual cone of the um, friction cone looks like, this just translates to uh, the normal contact velocity must be greater or equal to zero, which is just the unilateral contact constraints on velocity level. But what you can do is you can write it like this. This is just the time integral of, of, of uh, this vector over a short time period. And uh, it can be shown that uh, you do, of course, introduce an error, but the error you introduce is uh, small compared to the error introduced by the commonly used numerical integrators for, for granular matter and problems of this size. And also the error plays absolutely no role anymore uh, if we linearize our constraints, which we'll do later on in, in the numerical methods that we will use. So um, what do we gain by this? Well. We can derive the equations of motion using um, classical 
methods without having to worry about all the little devilish intricacies of Coulomb friction, because Coulomb friction is super hard. So now we just kind of uh, brush everything under the rug and hope that it works out. And if it ever does become a problem, we know where to look. Okay, so now um, uh, I've, I've established that my trajectories are all absolutely continuous. I formulated all my constraints as conical inclusions, which are inequality constraints, equality constraints, and can even be something um, more exotic. Uh, now the, the typical way of, of uh, the next step would be to derive the equations of motion. And we have already seen that, um, so, so we cannot use Newton's second law because um, well, it, it says the, the um, change of well, the force is the change of momentum and forces and accelerations don't exist anymore. So we have to go further back. We have to use um, an energy principle from classical mechanics. And there's a very nice paper by um, Remco Leine and his colleagues from 2009, which give us um, Hamilton's principle as a variational inequality, right? So, um, Typically, you would, uh, so, so classically, you would have the, the um, Frechet derivative of the action integral is equal to zero. This is the classical vision. Now, if, um, if, I'm, if, if you have a system that is constrained to some set M, which is tangentially regular, the um, principle looks like this. So um, now the, the variation is con uh, contained in the normal cone um, of M at Q. Um, and you'll see that this is actually a true generalization because if M is the whole space, then the normal cone becomes zero. And then you just get the classic version again. Okay, so um, some notes. So the normal cone is a subset of the dual space of absolutely continuous functions. And we've already established that uh, the dual space of absolutely continuous functions can be identified with a set of signed Radon measures in the sense that you can write any dual pairing as an integral over a, um, a signed Radon measure. Okay, so um, this gives us this set of equations. And from a numerical point of view, this is still um, very abstract and, and we cannot um, do much with it. But um, we have some information on the set M. And we know that the set M is characterized by conical inclusions. So we can um, uh, hope that we can characterize this equation using Lagrangian multipliers. So I'll um, give you this theorem which is a modified version from, uh, from a theorem about optimization in Banach spaces. So this can, uh, with the small modifications, it can be applied to this mechanical problem at hand. So basically what it says is, uh, assume you have uh, two Banach spaces X and Y and a closed convex cone K and Y. Also you have a mapping G, which maps elements of, from a of X to elements of Y, which is continuously Frechet differentiable. And um, we have a point Q, which is contained in the set that is defined by the conical inclusions of G and K. Uh, and then you have uh, an additional assumption that I don't want to talk about. This is a constraint qualification. This jumps, it's just something like the Robinson constraint qualification. Um, then if you have this, then there exists a lambda, the Lagrangian multiplier in the dual cone of K for every F in the normal cone um, 2m at q, such that you can write f in this fashion. Now, kind of, I've, I've, I've kind of made things worse, right? So this is much more abstract than I started out. So let me just um, dissect this uh, theorem a little bit. So the first thing that we'll note is um, that uh, there exists such a lambda for every f in the normal cone, and we know that the variation of the action integral is in the normal cone. So we can just uh, plug this in here. We can apply the theorem to um, the variation of the action integral. And the next thing that we can do is we have here some dual pairings and we know we can write those as an integral over um, some measure. So um, let me do that. So I just plugged it in and wrote the dual pairings as integrals. Now the next step that you would usually do is you would um, evaluate this variation. Um, and uh, if you do that, you end up with the uh, Euler-Lagrange equations. Now you cannot fully do that here 
uh, the best you can do is you can end up with something that looks like this. So you have um, an integral over the variation of Q times, um, yeah, this is the force. So um, the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the positions integrated over time. And then you have here an integral of um, the variation of Q with respect to the lebesgue stieltjes measure generated by um, yeah, the momentum of the system, which is the Lagrangian function, uh, the partial derivative of the Lagrangian function with respect to the velocity. And this is the best we can do because um, the momentum of the system will be discontinuous and we cannot, um, so, so it doesn't have a rather negative uh, Nicodem derivative with respect to dt. So we have to stick with this formulation. So if I plug this in, I get something like this. And uh, if we look at it closely, we see we have um, three integral terms all integrating over um, a variation in Q and the equality has to hold for all variations in Q. So basically we have a weak form. Yeah? So we end up with an equation, which is just a weak form. We do not get a strong form. And um, I'll just introduce a shorthand notation for this. I'll just say that this measure is equal to this measure plus this measure, all right? So can, this is just a shorthand notation. It's an equality of measures, which is just a shorthand notation for the weak form we just saw. Um, now all that's left to do is some cosmetics. Um, so we've seen that G is in K. We know that the Lagrangian multiplier is in the dual cone. Then we have this uh, orthogonality condition. And in literature, this is typically written as a, a cone complementarity problem that looks like this, F G and K. You have um, the, the Lagrangian multiplier now written as the, as the associated measure in the dual cone. And finally, I've already mentioned this, uh, this term right here is the momentum and this is the force. So what you see here is kind of a non-smooth uh, version of the other Lagrange equations. And if you uh, now plug in the Lagrangian of a multi-body system, you end up with these equations of motions, which is a much more um, recognizable form. And um, this derivation really helped me to understand what, uh, what a measure differential equation means, because this is what it is. This is a measure differential equation. And it's coupled to a um, cone complementarity problem down here. Okay, so, um, we want to solve this numerically. And to do so, we have to um, uh, uh, discretize this problem in time. And we've already seen that, um, yeah, so the, the measure differential equation is just a shorthand notation for a weak form. So we can actually kind of uh, look what the finite element people are doing, right? So they have a, a partial differential equation. They multiply it by some test functions, integrate over it, uh, get a weak form, and then they try to satisfy, satisfy this weak form in finite dimensional subspaces. And uh, the idea is let's do the same thing here. So we'll just take our weak form and uh, try to satisfy it in finite dimensional subspaces. So we'll identify all uh, functions that are absolutely continuous. So those are the test functions here and um, our positions. Um, and we'll try to satisfy this for all um, Q and phi, which are continuous and piecewise linear. Then we'll identify all um, functions which are of bounded variation, which is um, obviously the velocity. You can also find a function, a generator function for, for the um, d lambda here. So uh, our d lambda is generated by some function of bounded variation, which I will call lambda. And I can also consider this as just a piecewise constant function. Now, if I do this and juggle the terms a little bit and introduce some implicitness at the right location, I end up with um, these stepping, uh, stepping equations. Right, so these are now the uh, equations that I have to solve in every time step. And the subscript here actually means the time steps. So I, I get the new position from the old position and a new velocity. The new velocity uh, is given by a new unknown, gamma. And gamma is the solution to this cone complementarity problem. And you'll notice that uh, it doesn't say G here, but it says U. Now I've, uh, in the process uh, of deriving this, I've actually linearized my constraints. So now they reappear as kind of a stabilized velocity constraint. So really, I'm, I'm really using a velocity um, impulse-based method here. 
Um, right, there, so the constraint is linearized. And so, so it's a linear function in our gammas. And we have a matrix N here, which is symmetric and positive semi-definite. So um, in all interesting cases, really, it's ranked efficient. And we have to keep this in mind when um, choosing numerical solvers. Uh, our gamma is uh, the integral over our um, Lagrangian multiplier. And it's the new unknown. It, uh, it's kind of a net impulse over the entire time step. So in essence, we, um, this is easy, this is easy, this is the hard part, right? So in, in every time step, we have to solve a cone complementarity problem. And the question is, uh, how do we do that? So I, I put the cone complementarity problem on, on top here again. I just dropped the subscripts for better readability. And um, well, we, at that time, we, there were many options at that time. And um, I think for, for granular material, um, the most, so I don't wanna go over all these, the most dominant one was uh, the projected Klaus Jacobi method uh, in the literature. And uh, I think very rightfully so, because um, the projected Klaus Jacobi method um, works very well for large systems. It can be implemented in a matrix free fashion, which is um, really important because um, the dimension of this matrix N is uh, uh, three times N. Uh, 3n times 3n, and n is the number of contacts. And uh, the number of contacts changes from each time step to, uh, to the next, because you might have separation of material and the contact graph just changes with every time step. So the dimensionality of this matrix changes with every time step and to um, make sure you don't have to reallocate memory uh, with every time again, makes sense uh, to have a method that just relies on um, calculating matrix vector products. So you don't have to actually uh, represent this matrix somewhere in memory. Um, yeah, also it can be parallelized very nicely. And uh, finally, it has a very simple recursion. So basically what you see here is just um, a matrix vector product um, and a projection uh, onto the dual cone. And in my case, this is always the friction cone. So um, the projection onto the friction cone is, is quite cheap to calculate. Um, the projected Gauss-Jacobi method has some drawbacks, though. Mainly, um, it, it converges quite slowly for large densely coupled slit systems and large mass ratios. So on the, on the bottom right here, you see a typical convergence plot. So the x-axis shows you the iterations. The y-axis shows you um, the error. And typically, you would have uh, quite a good convergence in the first few iterations. And then uh, this just flattens out. And um, as a result, what happens is um, that uh, you have artificial compliance in the system. So you see here, um, the particle, uh, the, 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 the pile never gets to rest. You see uh, what it should look like in the back, but it just kind of melts away. And this is because uh, the cone complementarity problems aren't solved accurately enough. And uh, what's much more important is, um, that you don't get the draft forces. So what you see here is, um, here's, is, is uh, a blade is being moved through a bed of granular material. I think it's about 100,000 particles in here. And um, we've calculated this with the discrete element method. We've um, validated the result against experimental data. So that in gray, you see our reference solution. And then we try to replicate this reference solution with the projected Klaus Jacobi method um, and a time step size of 10 to the minus two seconds you'll see that we're very far off. Now, the good news is if we increase the number of iterations, we seem to get closer to the solution. So there seems to be some kind of convergence. And um, this is not self-explanatory because right now we are using a method that does not include any forces and accelerations. And we're actually trying to calculate forces from it. So the forces that we're getting here is just, um, we're dividing our gamma, our net impulse by the time step size and hope that uh, in average, the result is okay. So this is a hint that maybe we can use this method. And uh, now if we um, use lots of iterations and very small time steps, we see, okay, it does converge to um, our reference solution. So this is kind of nice, but um, it sort of defeats the purpose of going on smooth because now we have to use lots of iterations and small time step sizes. And it, in, in the end, we're much, much um, slower than if we just use the discrete element method. So um, 
if we want to use non-smooth methods, we need a faster solver. And we looked at the different um, numerical methods that were available at the time, and we couldn't find just the method that was fully satisfactory. We looked a little bit in, into continuous optimization, and we thought that the interior point methods looked very promising because um, they, they have the reputation of being very accurate. You can get very uh, small errors with it. And uh, they also have the reputation of um, having convergence rates that are almost um, independent of the problem size. So um, I, I implemented like a customized interior point method for our problem. And I'll just um, give you a short outline and show you some results on this. So um, we have um, frictional, we have, so, so I'm just say, thinking about frictional constraints. So we have a big system with many frictional constraints um, and um, fr sorry, frictional contacts. And per contact, we have a cone complementarity problem that looks like this. You have a vector u, which is uh, in this one cone, vector gamma, which is in the other cone, and the dot product of both must be zero. And here the subscript now um, refers to the contact, not the time step. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, add a linear transformation. So I'll get a new complementarity uh, problem. So, so my u's turn into y's and my gamma's turn into x's. And uh, they now must be included in the same cone, which is symmetric. So it's self-dual. Um, OK, so why am I doing this? Well, um, this self-dual cone C here is the uh, cone of squared with respect to the Jordan product, which is a um, product for three-dimensional vectors. So I have one three-dimensional vector and another one, and you can calculate the product and get, get a three-dimensional vector out of it again. And uh, if you look at all the square vectors with respect to this product, you end up with uh, this set. And I will um, use this later on. Okay, uh, the next thing we'll note is um, that we can reformulate the cone complementarity problem as um, an, a constraint optimization problem again. Because if X and Y are both included in this cone, then we already know that the dot product must be larger than um, zero. And uh, we are looking for the minimum where, where they're exactly zero, so we can just minimize the sum uh, over all contexts of these dot products. Uh, subject to the constraints that X and Y are in their respective cones, and we have this um, linear relation between Y and X. As a next step, we'll um, introduce a logarithmic potential, which pushes X and Y away from the boundary. So now we're minimizing our um, function from before, plus a, a potential function. Uh, now we, we have to change our constraint. We have to say that X and Y must truly be in the interior of the cone because uh, the potential takes infinite values at the boundary. So this is where the, the term interior point comes from. And we also have to respect our um, linear constraint here. And we can actually choose the potential in such a way that its zero set is a smooth curve that intersects the exact solution. And um, this zero set is called the central path, and we have um, a parameterization for it. So the, the central path is the set of all x and y, such that the Jordan product of x and y is a positive multiple of the unit vector. And we know that the solution is um, at the point where the Jordan product of x and y is equal to zero. So the idea of the interior point method is um, we'll use a sequence of Newton steps towards a zero of this function. So we're, we're trying to, uh, we're going for a step in the direction of the central path for a given alpha value. And then we'll just um, iteratively decrease alpha. And the idea is that this way, we'll approach the solution from a nice uh, region around the central path. So we'll stay clear from the boundary, stay in a nice uh, region around the central path and approach the solution from there. So um, this is what the algorithm, algorithm looks like. You start um, with an initial point, which has to be an interior point. 
uh, you choose your alpha. So you can choose um, a relatively large alpha. If you want a centralizing step, you can choose a relatively small alpha if um, you're bold and want to do a, a minimizing step. Then you calculate um, a block, a three by three block di diagonal matrix W from the previous iteration and a right-hand side B from the previous iteration and your chosen alpha. And then you do uh, the Newton step, which boils down to solving this linear system right here. Um, if you do that, uh, you can then calculate your new point and repeat. And the idea is, uh, now we have to solve a linear system in each iteration. Let's use a matrix-free conjugate gradient method right here for this linear system. And um, so, yeah, so I've implemented this and um, I, I laid out some, some test examples. So I have uh, one uh, pile of 2000 particles, which is my smaller test problem one. Then I have another test problem, which is a static pile of 5000 particles and a static pile of 10,000 particles. And I just calculate one time step in a static configuration with uh, both the projected Gauss-Jacobi method and the interior point method. You'll see the, that you have here the typical flattening of the convergence curve for the um, projected Gauss-Jacobi um, solver for all test cases, while um, you have nice fast convergence uh, with the interior point method. <clears throat> now you see here that um, the convergence rate also deteriorates with the problem size, but um, this is only because, so we, have, we don't have iterations here. We have the calculation time. So actually the number of iterations is small for all test cases. The convergence rate um, only uh, deteriorates a number of iterations uh, because of the linear solver. So if we could solve all our linear problems exactly, we wouldn't see any, so, so in my experience, uh, we didn't see any numerical um, deterioration of the convergence rates. Okay, as a next step, I, I um, checked how the calculation time, how the calculation time scales uh, with a problem size for a given tolerance. So here you see a very relaxed toler tolerance of five to the uh, times 10 to the minus two. And you see that uh, the interior point method for the smallest problem is a bit faster than projected Gauss-Jacobi. For the medium sized problem, we're still faster, but then for the large problem, the um, projected Gauss-Jacobi method is actually faster. So um, yeah, so if we, if we increase the tolerance here, the picture looks a lot different. So we're always faster with the interior point method and uh, it really pays for larger piles and larger tolerances. So uh, smaller tolerances. So basically um, use projected Gauss-Jacobi whenever you don't have high accuracy requirements, but if you do, uh, you should use the interior point method. Um, for even smaller tolerances, uh, the interior point method was more than 200 times faster. And uh, for tolerances far below this, I didn't get any solution using projected Gauss-Jacobi. Okay, then finally, I um, applied uh, the interior point method to an industrial size problem. So this is again, this trench uh, with where we drive the blade through it. Um, yeah, so it's, it's 100,000 uh, particles and um, we have to solve on average uh, 1.2 million unknowns in every time step. And we use a time step size of 10 to the minus two seconds. And uh, we solved um, these cone complementarity problems in each uh, time step to different tolerances. And you see here the force result. So yeah, so we do have to um, invest uh, high accuracy to actually get to the forces but we do achieve good agreement with the forces for a tolerance of 10 to the minus five. And at this, for this tolerance, we um, actually didn't manage to beat our own implementation of the discrete element method. It was still about 12.2% uh, faster, but it's the same ballpark. And uh, the nice thing is the interior point method is more than 10 times faster than the projected Gauss-Jacobi method. Okay, so uh, this brings me to the end. So um, the discrete element method is well suited for the prediction of draft forces. It's validated against experiments, uh, but it's only stable for very small time steps and it's computationally expensive. 
So uh, if you go to non-smooth contact dynamics, we have higher stability with, uh, with respect to this time step sizes. Uh, we lose information about forces and accelerations because there are only measures and not functions in classical time anymore. And we need to solve a complementarity problem per time step. Now with a new interior point method uh, solver, we can now actually use both discrete element methods and the non-smooth contact dynamics uh, method to estimate draft forces because we've seen we need a uh, high accuracy in the um, complementarity problem for this and the solvers that we um, knew couldn't give us that. Um, also, I think the interior point method still has lots of room for improvements. I think it can actually be made much faster, both on algorithmic level and also by parallelization. So everything I sh I've shown you today was um, uh, calculated sequentially. And I think the interior point method is, is quite easy to, to parallelize because you can just use a parallelized conjugate gradient method. And uh, there are some quite nice implementations for that. And then of course, I, I have to mention that I'm not the only person who worked on this and simultaneously with me. And of course, after my PhD, some other researchers also contributed very promising solvers that we did not have available at the time. So um, it would make sense to, to um, analyze how those solvers behave for this kind of application. Okay, so at the end, I still have some, some, some references. So this is a summary paper of my, my thesis. Uh, if, if you're interested in more details, uh, you can take a look in my thesis, which is right here. And then finally, um, this is a more recent um, archive preprint of a now accepted book chapter on that I wrote with my supervisor on uh, DAEs and also non-smooth dynamical systems. Right, um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention.